Okay. <clears throat> okay. Ready. All right. This is this is building data visual applications with WPF and Silverlight and Surface. Welcome. Hi, my name is Tim, and this is a fun session. I love doing this session because, unlike my prior two sessions, if you know me, I'm a lot more comfortable demoing or in front of Visual Studio than I am in front of PowerPoint, and this is all demo. Is um, Help me out here. Is anyone here that wasn't in either of my prior two sessions? Really? Okay. All right, then we'll we'll do it. We'll do a couple foundational concepts. So, let's get rolling. Um, this is the uncomfortable about Tim slide. What else can I say unique about this? Uh, I, you know, I, I work for this cool company, uh, Microsoft Application .NET Partner of the Year. We build a lot of software for companies large and small. Our biggest client is Microsoft, but for instance. We are building Silverlight 3 and, and Windows 7 Touch applications for NASA right now and, and uh, uh, software for the cancer industry that I'll show you. And so we're, we're you know, helping people save lives there and we're helping kill people by writing WPF applications for fast food restaurants in the United States. So um, it's all .NET and it's pretty fun work, a lot of bleeding edge stuff. So. Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about WPF and Silverlight and Surface as it relates to visualizing data. Okay? Um, I wish I had the table and the camera looking down at the table so you could see me uh, demoing it. The, the closest thing I can come to that is running a little video uh, of some of the software built for Surface. So I will do that. The, the mission of this session the, the prior two sessions were all about the foundations and introductions to, to XAML and, and declarative programming. The mission of this session, as designed by the WPF team, uh, is to get you excited about technology, excited about WPF, so you go out there and do it. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about why the heck you need this stuff. There's just some things, there's many things you cannot do in the browser, and that's that's the reason for some of this WPF stuff. Oh, before I forget, everything I show you today, and I've only got an hour, and I have a ton of demo. Um, I'm, I'm almost positive everything I show you today, you are more than welcome to have. Uh, let's see, what else are we talk? We'll talk a little bit about roadmap and demos, demos, demos. So let's start out with a bang. This is an application that we built for the Scripps Research Institute. The Scripps Research Institute is the largest nonprofit cancer resource organization in the world. This application was the keynote demo for the Windows Vista launch at uh, NASDAQ in New York City. So you won't remember me from that, but you'll remember Steve Ballmer. I was the guy driving the, the computer. Uh, this, you know, for, for all we know, you know, this is supposedly a cancer molecule or SARS or something like that, but for all we know, it's what's appropriate for Norway. This is a, a reindeer molecule, for all we know, right? Um, the, the Scripps Research Institute and many of these other entities uh, that do cancer research have lots of toys. They have lots of 3D tools. In fact, they have a room where you put on the glasses and you can walk into this molecule in 3D space. But what, what they don't have or didn't have until this application was a way to tie everything together. This application, and I'll open up another molecule, and while it's doing that, well, that's kind of a boring molecule. Um, while it's doing that, uh, believe it or not, when I double click on one of those molecules and I have authenticated already, I've gone through that process of authenticating, this is production data where I'm hitting um, uh, web services way back in San Diego, California where the Scripps Research Institute is. But what's unique about this application is that when I do that, I am checking out a giant text file from SharePoint. Believe it or not, this is a smart client front end for SharePoint. So when I open up one of these molecules, uh, it's checking out a text file. It's not, 
XML. It's not beautifully structured XML. It's not comma delimited. Delimit, delimited. It's not in any format you've ever seen. The, in this world, they have this file format called the protein database format. Uh, a molecule like this goes a mile long, you know, 50,000 lines. But would you not argue that even though I checked that out from SharePoint and it rendered it in real time here, that it's pretty performant? WPF does a darn good job if your computer has the capability to do it. Uh, this isn't God's gift to computers, but, you know, it's a relatively new laptop, and it rates like a 3.2 out of 5 on, in Windows 7. Um, so what the heck is this? These little cartoon views right here, this is the actual research. Um, or it might be test data because this is their publicly available site. Here, the annotations of the research. So what these folks do is they decide they want to study something and they make a selection and either they drag and drop their research and their research could be a a text file or a word document excel it could be a url on a linux server because this world is all unix and linux uh, uh, if, if any of you were in this world you know that it's not a total windows world here or they right click and they drag and drop and they affix that piece of research on the 3D surface of the cancer molecule, which is pretty darn cool. So behind the scenes, so when I drag and drop, if I, you know, if I search my computer for something with the word cancer in it, and I drag and drop it and stick it onto this area, ultimately what happens behind the scenes is the piece of research, and let's say it's a Word document, and then an XML structure with the coordinates of 3D, X, Y, Z, a zoom and a rotation uh, in a little XAML file get checked into SharePoint with it. So that's how you can come back to this needle in a haystack. And some of these molecules are intensely uh, complicated and get to where you're working the next day. This is kind of revolutionary. It runs their business now. Now, you may be saying to yourself right now, well, there's no way Tim's going to give me that code. Uh, because it's a professional application, and it's all that cool. It's 20,000 lines of C-sharp. Well, in fact, I'd be more than happy to give you this code, but the problem is that you do not want a 20-gig VPC of SharePoint. You don't want to download that from me, right? Uh, you want to download just the code and be able to open one of these molecules directly so we built a standalone version of this. I think that's the, uh, the molecule I just looked at. It has the same functionality. It has all the 3D. It has, I didn't show you, you know, there's, there's this type of stuff. There's this different views. There's something called full chain. I'm not a scientist, so I don't know what the heck we're looking at, right? Uh, waters god knows what this is now the other day they explained to me that if i go into temperature that view so i, I didn't know this but our the uh, molecules or i didn't remember this <laughs> from school but molecules vibrate and the temperature shows how rapidly they vibrate um, and again this is well I, I i didn't tell you this how does that text file get created the, the one that gets rendered here in 3d uh, they have invented this machine that looks at a drop of blood and identifies the metastasizing cancer cell and creates that text file. And it happens in 22 seconds. That's revolutionary because the prior technology took two days. So within a, a short time frame, you'll be able to find out if you have cancer or not in a matter of seconds when you go to the doctor. And, and the current thinking from these people, if you're interested, is that all humans have cancer at some level. You know, we, we've had the true pleasure of working with these brilliant people. Um, all humans have cancer at some level. We just have genetic problems. It just so happens that we die before some of these things manifest. You know, you could live your whole life with cancerous tumors, but until something metastasizes, travels in the blood, then, you know, typically you're okay. And, of course, there's a million different types of cancer and such. Um, believe it or not, this company also invented a way to, um, to uh, identify the, metast the metastasizing cancer cell in the blood, and uh, it poisons it or it mutates it or it does something, effectively curing cancer. 
That's the good news. I'm a good news, bad news type of guy. You know what the bad news is? Anyone? They told me these Norwegian audiences aren't, you know, interactive, and I can't even see you anyways. The bad news is it kills the rat in the process. But, but nonetheless, that, that is a, an amazing breakthrough in cancer research. So, yes, you can have all this source code. We are not going to step through it today because, like I said, there's, there's 20,000 lines of C Sharp just to do the 3D. And it has stuff like this. You know, I'm the guy who was in high school. I'm the guy that was sitting in class staring at the pretty girls and fantasizing as opposed to listening in calculus. So a lot of this stuff, can you imagine stepping through this stuff? I've been stepping through this code now for a year. It's intense at some points, especially when it's got this. Now, I can do a whole session on this application, and every once in a while I get someone in the audience who says, Tim, that's not calculus. That's, do there any math people here? That's trigonometry. Okay, so point of interest. All right, so um, you could do your own 3D with this engine. And the, the thing about WPF is the hard part is getting your object into 3D. That's what this guy does. Once you have it in 3D, you've got the method and event level support that we're so used to. So you could have 3D object dot zoom, 3D object dot rotate, things like that. All right, moving right along. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, we don't need to talk about that. All right, just a little bit about Silverlight for those of you who were in at my prior two sessions. Ultimately, Silverlight is a little, tiny little brother to WPF. It's just a small portion of WPF, less than 20%. So that awesome 3D rotating of the molecule business, you can't do that in Silverlight. It does not have any support for 3D right now. It's going to have rudimentary support for 3D in the version that's coming at the end of the year, Silverlight 3, but you still won't be able to do the, that spinning of the molecule like that. Uh, the good, that's the bad news. The good news is it's cross-platform and browser-based, so you get that broad reach. All right, I love doing this demo because this is a great example. I think this is a great example of the type of things we can do in the browser that we never dreamed of doing just a few short years ago. Does anyone, has every, anyone ever heard of this website, 43things.com? I assume no one. Usually no one. Uh, this is the world's most popular website, that, social networking website, that no one's ever heard of. It's won a Webby Award. It's won all these awards. But to me, and again, realize that I have no design skills at all, to me, this looks like eBay or any other browser-based application. The business, the business solution here is um, you persist. This is like your bucket list. This is the, the 100 things you want to do before, before you pass on, or in this case, 43. So for me, one of them would be fishing above, fly fishing above the Arctic Circle for Norwegian salmon, which I am doing on Friday. Okay, so I can check that one off. But this guy right here, um, you know, it, it looks like a web app. You know, it's got this tag-based stuff, but this, this looks just like a web app to me. Now, at Internology, we have to keep up on um, technology. We're, we're a bleeding-edge type company. So over a weekend, one of my guys, who was already savvy in WPF, wanted to learn, learn Silverlight. Well, that 43things.com website... Uh, is built in Ruby. It's the other world, and Ruby on Rails, and all that other stuff. But they were smart and savvy enough to expose an API. It's in REST-based web services. We're like the, the poor man's web services, right? So over a weekend, one of my guys built this little app that consumes their REST-based web services in the 43things.com site and then renders it in uh, a graphical manner. Now, actually, it doesn't matter. I've demoed this a couple times recently. It doesn't matter what I say at this point because you're not listening to me. You're, you're looking at the pretty girls that are zooming by or the weirdo wishes that are going by, right? But every one of these things is, is hot-linked. So if I want to see all the people who have live 
as one of the goals that we, they want to do in their life. I can, I can do that type of thing. Uh, but I think that's pretty cool. Oh, by the way, I, I didn't tell you, but the, the WPF control that does the 3D rendering, the cancer molecule, that was built in two weeks by one developer at Internology. Not because Kevin Kennedy is infinitely brilliant. Uh, he's a sharp, young developer, but because WPF is that good. And he was smart enough to find the math uh, in C Sharp out on the Internet. So he just basically plunked that in there, which I think is pretty good. And I, I'm all about developer productivity. Okay, so there's a great example of visualization in Silverlight. Okay, very quickly, since I've already done this slide twice, what the heck is XAML, this tag-based, funky syntactical language? As far as you, the .NET developer, is concerned, it is simply a way to construct initial, initialize objects. That's all you care about. An object might be a text box or some other control on a form, but it is a .NET object. And, and it's the way we separate the UI, truly loosely couple the UI, from the underlying C sharp. And I've already talked to this slide twice. Here's some example of, of XAML, so I'll go quickly. Uh, believe it or not, uh, you can run XAML-based uh, uh, files natively in the browser. Most of us are, are familiar with them in Silverlight or WPF or Surface, but the browser itself, any browser that has a .NET plugin, will render them. So let me show you and make a point at the same time. Let me show you some XAML that you probably haven't seen yet. Um, yeah, here, this one's perfect. So I'm going to execute this guy. Notice how quickly that renders that 3D in the browser, all right? That's kind of neat. You may recognize it. That's the logo for the Script Research Institute, the Scripps Research Institute on the first demo that I did, you, did for you. The reason I show you that is this. Here is the XAML to do that 3D logo. And here is the XAML. Here, I'll speed up. And here is the XAML, not even halfway through. How about that? How'd you like to debug that? Okay, this thing is a monster just to do that tiny little logo. Why do I show you that? Because in XAML, I mean, as programmers, as .NET developers, we're used to just getting in there. We might as well use Notepad in some cases, right? In fact, there are, I can promise you, there are people in Microsoft on the product teams that still use Notepad to build software. All right, we like to hack. In XAML, you're going to use tools. Tools to create files like this. And then you're going to get there in there and tweak with them, of course. But no human could, in their right mind, sit and type that 5,000 lines, I believe it is, of XAML to do that. And I will show you, coming up here in a little demo, a number of tools that you will use to build WPF applications. WPF is one of, and Silverlight, and Surface is one of those unique places where we, we use more than just Visual Studio. And you have to. Visual Studio doesn't come close to doing it all. So we have to use a suite of tools. All right, how does this all work? Well, it's built on what's already in the OS. And the OS would be Windows Vista and above. So it's built on 3D, which means it's RAP, direct 3D. Being RAP means you will not be able to build the, these games that my son plays where he kills people, Halo and, and Doom and, and, and all these, these, these software games. It, it just doesn't have enough guts. If you had an awesome computer um, and and the right OS, technically you might be able to pull off that performance, but not typically. Okay, so typically WPF can do games and such, but not these Twitch-based games, because ultimately it's wrapped. It is using the GPU, yo, though, automatically. We get that for free. So if you have a fancy GPU in your desktop computer or even a notebook like this, it will use it and you'll get that type of performance. Okay, so with a little demo, Actually, this is a big demo with tons of steps that I have the potential to screw up. But with this demo, I want to show you a suite of tools that you will be using when you do this stuff, when you do Silverlight or WPF 
or, or surface. And at the same time, I want to simulate the design to dev uh, process that Microsoft keeps shoving down our throat. Meaning, for the last two years, you've heard that in our project teams, Scrum or Agile or not, we are going to have these black turtlenecked $500 an hour type artists that live in our Visual Studio solutions. Now, I can tell you from practice, that's very difficult, not because of technology, just because these people are so different from us. And, and many of these people would rather die than give up their Adobe suite of tools and use something like Blend or such and that. But when you do get access to an artist <clears throat> who is good, um, man, some great stuff comes out. And I totally appreciate them now. All right, so I'm opening a reference application. What is a reference application? An app, a reference application is an app that is, oh, that's debugging stuff, uh, designed for you to learn a technology. Uh, this is Family Show. This is publicly available on CodePlex. Microsoft paid this company, Vertigo Software, to build this application. Uh, this is about genealogy. I personally am not into genealogy, but there are gazillions of people around the world that are. This is the family tree of the Wimser family. I believe that's Prince Charles' line of, of, of genealogy. If you're into this, they have this, jet, this standard GEDCOM format. It's available all over the Internet. You, you probably can find your family tree for free. But you could definitely pay $10 US for, for your family tree out there. And you can use this app, um, and many people do, uh, to track your family tree and such. It's a, it's a CRUD app, so you know here I'll open a, a synthetic family. Oh, wait, before I do that, let me show you. Before I show you The Simpsons, let me show you one of the controls I just adore. Uh, I'm going to zoom out. Now, notice this control right here. It's a, a timeline control. Notice as I scroll backwards in time, people start disappearing that, because they haven't been born yet. I, I think that is so cool. That's great functionality. So this app does have some business intelligence in it, uh, just enough so it's not overwhelming. Just It's not abstracted in bizarre design patterns. Uh, here's a synthetic family. Here are the Simpsons. Right, If I scroll upwards, I can see Homer. You know, I can marry Homer off. I can give him, I should have a picture of him, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, you, I'm trying to get you guys to laugh at some point, but believe it or not, believe, you're, you're going to find this hard to believe. Vertigo Software is one of our partners. They're very similar to us. Uh, their, their CEO, my equivalent, is one of my best friends in the world. And he told me the other day the number one feature request they have for this is to have multiple wives. Believe, isn't, it, isn't that typically American? That is so American, so Utah. Uh, there are business rules in here that prevent you from having multiple wives. So in the version they just came out with, you can marry 20 people. Uh, I've been married for 20 years, and I can't handle one woman, so God knows why you'd want multiple of them. But um, the, the point being here is there's business intelligence in this guy. All right, let me go, and uh, well, let's hack on this with a number of tools. Um, what our mission will be is we'll steal the app. We'll get rid of the Vertigo logo and put our logo in there, and then I assume I'll have time and I'll do a gratuitous animation for you in Blend uh, just to show you how easy it is to do that. So I'm going to keep the application open, uh, thinking out loud. The first tool I need is Microsoft Expression Design. Now, this, the, the funny thing... The amusing thing about Microsoft Expression Design is when first drawn up many years ago, uh, when first blueprinted, this was the um, Adobe Illustrator killer, believe it or not. Now, if you know these artists or if you use a Adobe Illustrator, you know that these people would rather work at McDonald's than give up Illustrator. Illustrator is an awesome application. and. They've been, these people typically have invested millions of man in, years in it, so they're just not going to give it up for something new. But even if you don't or your artists don't use this application, 
uh, it does something really cool that you will use it for. It allows you to take native Adobe Illustrator artwork and get XAML out of it. In WPF and Silverlight, it's a XAML-based world. Everything is XAML, right? We don't have pings or, or JPEGs or things like that anymore because XAML can become an object. And you can animate and rotate and do things with objects. All right, so uh, I was going while talking. I have a new document, so I'm going to import thinking out loud that, you know, we could put any Adobe Illustrator artwork in this. It just so happens the only thing I have is our logo. I'm not trying to do a gratuitous commercial here. There's our logo that we undoubtedly paid some artists way too much for. I'm going to select it because I know from practicing this demo that for some bizarre reason, the artist put this in layers. God, it seems pretty 2D to me. So to flatten it out, I do group. Now, remember I told you that um, the, the sole purpose in life of, of XAML, as far as we care as .NET developers, is to initialize and construct objects. Well, I need to give these objects a name so we can deal with them later, right? So I'll call it IK logo, and I need to remember the case sensitivity because um, um, that is extremely important in a XAML-based world. All right, so now I've got it. I'm going to export it, and I don't want a PNG format. I want a XAML WPF resource dictionary, and you'll see why here in a second. I want the objects. Um, I need to put it somewhere where I remember where I put it. So let me put it in a temporary directory. And I can call it like... I can call it like... Sorry. How about Norway IK.xaml. Now, you would think I would have outputted it right there, but I just gave it a name. Really, I need to click this. My mouse would come back to life. I need to click this Export All button, and now it's exported to the disk. So that was Microsoft Expression Design. Um, da, 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 da. So now we have, I'm thinking out loud, we have the XAML on disk. We need to validate that it actually looks good, that it works. Okay, and there are plenty of tools out there that do that. I like to use a tool called XAML Cruncher. Uh, Charles Petzold, like one of the, the godfathers of our industry, wrote a XAML book that's like this thick. And with this book, he provides this free tool. Again, if you send me a note at the end of this session, I'll point you to all this stuff. But this is XAML Cruncher. When you install anything Visual Studio, Anything expression, service packs, God knows that it probably installs in the browser when you install IE, but you get a tool called XAMLPad. That's the free Microsoft tool that renders XAML. This is XAML Cruncher. Okay, so I, I have XAML Cruncher. I need to go out to the disk and get that file though, right? So I put it in temp and I called it Norway something or other. Da 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 da. There it is. And I'm going to take out just the drawing brush because all that resource dictionary stuff that wraps it and then the glue to the fame framework and all that business, I know from practicing this demo that it's already in the Family Show application. So let me copy this. Again, this is the Internology logo that has been pulled out of of um, the Adobe Illustrator file. I'm going to paste it right here. Now, notice it's not rendering yet. What's rendering still is this. Now, this joke isn't going to work that well because we're in Norway, but is anybody familiar with that? That's a baseball team in America. I live in San Diego, California, so that's the enemy. Um, I, I refuse to say that out loud, but in this vector-based world, these artists have 64,000 colors, and they've named them all. So that you've got stuff like this, too. Regular blue, Alice blue. Can you see that? Yeah, light blue. There's like, you know, 3,000 shades of blue. But we want to make sure the Internology logo renders correctly. 
So I have to remember a little syntax here. Red is dead. That means syntactically I'm, re I'm incorrect. From the prior s sessions, remember static and dynamic resources. Uh, and then I called this, uh, I called it IK logo right here. There's its name, there's the weird naming convention uh, that's in XAML. So if I type IK low, was it L? Like that? Yes. Okay. So now we've proven that it renders correctly, and one would argue it did a darn good job, uh, Microsoft Expression Design did, of pulling it out of the Adobe Illustrator artwork and outputting it to XAML. Uh, now, some of these Illustrator files with 30 levels, architectural drawings and all this that are immediate, you know, intensely complex and use all the features of Illustrator are not going to do that well here, just as a, as a point of interest. So. Uh, while I was playing around, uh, just to show you the vector-based world we live in, you know, like I think this is the I and T. I assume this is the T. So I could do something like, uh, there, right? And really, if we had branding police in Aeronology like they do at Microsoft, that would really agitate some people. Uh, while I'm here playing around, let me show you, uh, how about this? There, there is a session on MSDN. It's an hour and a half long, and it's a guy from the Expression Design team, and he shows you how to build a button and he, in WPF, and he takes an hour and a half to do it. Because, and it doesn't even have any C-sharp on the other side. There's no event for it. It's just the button and the different states of the button. All right, and the reason it takes him an hour and a half is he shows you in these tools how to do all the gradient shading and, and all that business. But I think I'm a lot cooler than him because I could do this. Da, da. Button. Uh. And now I've got a ridiculously huge nonsensical button. Notice my hover over changes and the, the, the si sizing automatically changes on the click event. That, that's pretty darn cool that you could do that, but I digress. That has nothing to do with this demo. Uh, so now uh, I want to grab that drawing brush, and we're okay with the blue business because I didn't cut and paste, and God knows how to, well, I guess I could, I could figure out what that color is. But I'm going to copy this. I just did a Control-C. All right, so we've been in design, exported it, we've been in XAML Cruncher, proved that it's valid. Now we can go over to Blend. Microsoft Expression Blend, which is the tool you absolutely will use when doing WPF. And I want to, since I'm practicing, it should have remembered. Yeah, this is the Visual Studio solution that is already open in Visual Studio. So they'll behave side by side. First thing I want to do, and here's the Family Show application. Here is the logo we want to hack on. Now, Microsoft Expression Blend is wildly functional. It creates a ton of XAML for you. And it is also, for an old guy like me, very intimidating. Uh, I've been trying to learn this tool to a proficient level forever. And still, there's some you know, areas of gray for me. So for instance, if I try to select this logo and it doesn't work, I choose the other selection button and it does. I don't know why there's two, but that, that's the behavior that I've trained myself. All right, earlier in the, in the sessions before, I told you that if you want to find some great artwork on the internet, you uh, look for a file called appstyles.xaml. That's a common naming convention for where all the artwork lives. Okay. Uh, notice it won't render because this has all the styles. Right? You can't render all of them. It can only, you can only render one. So I'll go to XAML view. Remember I have <coughs> the logo still in my paste buffer. So I'm simply going to go down to the bottom and paste it in there. So there's the Internology logo. Now it is a dynamically loaded, loaded resource to this application. I'll save just for the heck of it. I don't think we have to. It's saved. Okay, so now that we have the resource, let me come over here. I still have this guy um, selected. 
Now, if we're going to steal this application appropriately, we might as well rename the rectangle object, right? Well, if I could type. All right, now look at this closely. There are many areas of this demo that I could go into Notepad and type the XAML. I could figure out how to do it. it. It took me forever to figure out, or I had to get help on how to do it in Blend. Here is one of those spots. I, for those of you my age, or around my age, see this tiny little green pixel, three pixel button here? That is the advanced properties for the fill method on this rectangle object. Took me forever to find that. And I know that since I just added the Internology logo to appstyles.xaml, I know that it is now a resource to the application, so I can just pick it, and we have effectively stolen the application. All right? But every WPF application has a gratuitous animation, right? So let me show you how to do one in Blend. Um, I'm going to add an event when that Internology rectangle. Now, here's another pet peeve of mine. For those of you who have been writing software for longer than, or on the Microsoft platform for longer than five years, have you noticed how they keep changing our event names every two or three years? Like, it, it, it used to be hover, hover over, mouse over, um, now it's in WPF, it's mouse enter. God knows why they keep changing this stuff. But when I hover over the rectangle, I want to spin it. Okay? Now, behind, as I'm clicking behind the scenes, this is creating a ton of XAML. Remind me to show it to you when we're done here. All right, so we'll add a new action. When we want a new storyboard. Now, there's, there's many ways to create animations in XAML. This is the easiest. A storyboard's like a movie. Runs top to bottom. Doesn't matter what we call it. It's just a demo. I get a timeline here. I get a timeline here. Where is my timeline? I've run out of space. It's hiding. Here, let me see if I can figure this out. Darn it. Um, one of the tricky things about Microsoft Expression Blend is I can't make it smaller or bigger, and I've only got so much screen resolution. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, all right. Here is another thing that, in fact, I never figured this out. I never figured this is one line of code in a timeline, a storyboard. There is a keyframe tag. The keyframe tag tells you or allows you to run it infinitely as opposed to running the storyboard just once. I could go into Notepad at this time or just go into the editor and type the keyframe tag. But someone from the Blend team showed me that, see this little plus thing? If I click that, I get the keyframe tag. Now, this makes sense to me. If I drag this, I've dragged it to 0.6. That means I'm going to run this animation for 0.6 seconds. OK? Thinking out loud. Now, what, oh, what the heck am I going to do? I'm going to do this. I'll go to the transform section. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. I'll spin it once. I'll rotate it 360. And then I'll spin it back. You can see that it's rendered back. That should work. It should go like this and like this. Does anyone have confidence that this is going to work? Because um, I don't. All right, I don't have to stop my recording. I'm going to hit F5 right from here. You should notice down here, using MS Build, just like Visual Studio. Now, if I come over here and hover over, ta-da! Wasn't that magical? You don't seem too excited about it. Uh, here, this is a big deal, though. I'm hitting F4 to get a better view on this. Uh, this is all the XAML it created. And just, my, just by me clicking and dragging and doing all that stuff, that's pretty darn good. See, all this, there's the animations. You can you imagine typing all that? So you will use Blend. It's a pretty good tool for doing that. It's just 
you know, for old guys like me, it's so hard to, to get used to this, this interface. All right, moving right along. I have 20 minutes. That's good because I've got a lot to show. All right. So, you know, we work so closely with Microsoft and are helping them build their products. It's very rare that something comes across that I just don't get wind of. This is one of the things that just shocked me. You know, I, I guess it's because I never anticipated that we'd be able to do the stuff that those DirectX people do in .NET. So the, the reason for this is that, for beautiful user interfaces, 3D, fancy stuff like that. The technologies that do this are very mature. Some of them are over 20 years old. That doesn't mean they're going away. But to give the .NET developer the power of doing this, I mean, the developer ratio, if there's any DirectX programmers out there, the, the developer productivity ratio is like 20 to 1. I mean, we get, we get a ton for free. What's the smoothing of the edges? Um, what's the, the, there's a name for it. Anti-aliasing. Anti-aliasing. We get that for free in WPF, whereas in some of these uh, uh, other technologies, you actually have to code for that. All right, so let's take a look at 3D. We came off that, what we affectionately call the cancer app. And, you know, I told the guy, which is tremend at tremendously satisfying building software for this company at the expense of almost bankrupting the company because we mostly build this software for them for free. Uh, I come off and say, well, you know, no one wants to spin, spin a cancer molecule. Do we have anything that's close to a 3D standard in our industry? And the closest thing we could come up with is AutoCAD. AutoCAD is um, not a um, .NET company, though. It's a Microsoft partner, but it's, it's all C++. So would you believe, over a weekend, uh, the guy, one of our engineers built this app. I did a, a demo at the zoo the other day and did the panda. Here's my favorite drawing. Well, one of our guys built this app over a weekend. Notice I've got a 3D rendering. This is an actual AutoCAD drawing. It's some type of robot. I don't know what the heck it does. Uh, but notice as I click, see it's pulling the structure apart, even as giving us down to the property level, like who created this stuff. This is all in the native in the AutoCAD uh, drawing. Now, how in the world can a human build something like that so quickly? Um, it's not because these guys, trust me, it's not because these guys are infinitely brilliant. It's because we have the 3D engine already done, the one I'm going to give to you, and the AutoCAD folks have an SDK. It's all C++, but one of our guys with some C++ experience wrapped that in managed C++, wrap their SDK and manage C++, thereby exposing their interface to our .NET application. And that way we could do all the, f the opening of the file and all that for free. The 3D part was already done. That, that's pretty darn impressive that you could do that. Here is uh, an architectural drawing in, in AutoCAD. It, it, they have this wildly, this, this file format's been around for 20 years, so you can have multiple drawings within one file. You saw thumbnails and things like that. Here's the drawing, and it's also got the 3D site in here. So I could zoom right into the house, you know, into a kitchen or a, a room or something like that. Uh, here's the house in a hurricane. That's, that's an American joke, sorry. Um, so I, I think that's wildly impressive. Uh, keyboard command that makes the window smaller. Alt spacebar. Yeah, OK, good. So I've run out of screen real estate for that. So um, the Cancer app rendered the 3D on the fly. That was a text file. The AutoCAD app is opening a drawing natively, OK? This guy right here. This is a demo of a real application that is at the largest heart surgery center in the Midwest of America. This guy opens a pre-rendered drawing of anatomical images. This does not steer scalpels. This is effectively a uh, heart surgery documenting tool. And heart surgeons don't use mice. Uh, what, what happens is these brilliant folks do, at least where I live, they do 12 to 14 surgeries a day. 
and they have five minutes in between, and they run from operating room to like an administrative room, and they spew out all this mumbo jumbo of what they did. And now they use a light pen on a big plasma screen with this application, and they draw, you know, because this is just a template of the heart. Here's the actual images of the patient, and notice it orients, orientates to where it was done. So they'll draw an artery and say, well, in the patient, the one I worked on looks like this. Oh, wait, I screwed up. Eh. All right, it actually looks like this type of thing. Now, can you imagine the, the math behind that where we're trying to figure out the difference between erasing and drawing? Um, and then they say, in this world, you either, you either do a stent or a lesion. A stent props up the artery, a lesion tears it down, and they say, I did a lesion, or I, did a, I put in a stent in this guy's artery, and then the, the wave file, the actual voice of the surgeon's mumbo-jumbo gets stuck in 3D space to that 3D place in the heart, and then also goes up into SharePoint. But typically, surgeons don't... Um, operate on the outside of the heart, right? They operate on the inside. So let me turn the inside on and the exterior off. And now, yeah, I mean, if I knew what the heck of I was doing, I could, I could zoom into an aorta or something like that. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that cool? Amazing. WPF. So this control, again, because we had the 3D engine already built, this control right here was just um, six weeks to develop. The actual application went into production in like eight weeks. Quit is Alt F4, right? Okay, good. All right, moving right along. I have 13 minutes. <sighs> All right, audience participation time. They told me you wouldn't participate. You're going to prove them wrong, right? Uh, does WPF enable me to do, to do something I couldn't have done before? Well, of course not, unless you, unless you talk about developer productivity. In older technologies like DirectX, some of this stuff would have taken 30 people four years to do. In WPF, since we're so productive in .NET, we can do it uh, much quicker. Is DirectX dead? Anyone? <laughs> of course not. We still need... Doom and Halo for my 14-year-old. Uh, are wind forms dead? Anyone brave enough for this one? Uh, you could, people argue both ways. You know, Microsoft is going to support wind forms forever and ever and ever because we need a rich client solution for Windows 98 and below. Because WPF only runs on Windows XP and above, right? But... The last version of WinForms we got was in 2005, and we're never, ever, ever getting a new version of WinForms. There's no WinForms team anymore. Uh, if, if you're not doing this now, you will be. I mean, the, the future of the Microsoft.NET stack is XAML-based, okay? Um, oh, and the good news is, like for many of our customers, you don't have to, th if you've been doing WinForms for a long time, you don't have to throw away gazillion man hours of investments. It's brain dead simple to integrate uh, a WPF control in your current WinForms app or the other way around. Brain dead simple. And thank goodness Microsoft made it easy for us. Um, does WPF run better on Vista than on XP? There's a joke in here. You're supposed to say, well, nothing runs good on Windows XP. But, but in fact, and I had to add Windows 7 to it now since it's so close to shipping. Uh, in fact, because I think I already mentioned this, because those geniuses on the Windows team created a new um, hardware access layer that talks directly to the hardware. If you have a GPU, it uses it, which means WPF uses it. All right. Does Silverlight trump all this WPF stuff? One would think, with all the marketing dollars and all with the hysteria we hear about Silverlight, one would think that's the case. Hopefully that is not, but it's definitely noticeable that Microsoft is putting all its effort into Silverlight right now, uh, which, which makes all this stuff relative, of course. All right, I promised you some Surface. I've got 10 minutes. Let me use eight of it. Uh, and to do that, I have a little video of a sample of some of the Surface stuff we've done. 
and then for you to hear it, I'm going to take this thing off.
my hands too. I'm rotating while Kevin is having a total loose So this app is essentially a sign reader. So the doctor can select an image and have the heart orient to the, to the image so that they're able to annotate on the arterial structure. So most people, this order right here is not in this position. I can erase it and draw it exactly like the way it appears in the patient's heart. Exactly. Okay, clearly some of my developers have too much time on their hands uh, with that thing. All right, th that is just WPF. All those controls you get for free. The only thing that we wrote for some, some code for that I noticed is when you put your finger down and it automatically oriented to the point, place of your finger, we wrote a little bit of code for that. All those applications were brain dead simple to do because we had already built the WPF versions of them. So they the, so porting those to the surface was a matter of days as opposed to a matter of weeks. Really, it's not rocket science to build applications for the surface. And if it ever does become a consumer device like Microsoft and Bill Gates are promising us, uh, then we are going to be building this stuff too. I have three minutes. Let me show you one more thing. This This is a rare port. We had built that uh, you probably guys didn't see it here, but that application for the United States election uh, for the surface, Microsoft was an official partner of the US elections and we built that app for the surface. It was on TV and such, I doubt you guys saw it, but uh, we just ported it, pay no attention to that, we, we just ported it to Silverlight. And this was brain dead simple because we already had it done in WPF. There's just a few things we couldn't do. So very quickly, here is the app. Uh, F11, yeah. Uh, here's the app. Uh, the the, it was in Denver, wasn't it? Yes. Here's the convention we just had in Denver. Here is our current president. Here he is with Oprah. That always get, even you guys laughed at that joke. That always gets a laugh. Uh, notice, you know, I don't have the stretch control or the scatter view is what it's called in Surface. So I do a deep zoom, the deep zoom composer, and I can zoom in on this guy, right? And it's got the videos and all that stuff. Navigate my way back, and we can see the Republican thing. But I am out of time, so let me end this session with, I hope you're inspired by some of the cool software, especially all that 3D stuff that you can do. At the end of this deck are a number of places you can go next that for those of you who have seen my prior sessions have already seen that before. So with that, if you want any or all of this stuff, send me an email. And uh, I, I already told you I'm going out into the wilderness uh, starting tomorrow. So give me till Tuesday of next week. But I promise you I will send you links to all this stuff. OK, that's it. Wish I had more time because I have tons more demos, but uh, that's it. And thanks for coming.